Uh, this will be more about physics. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, I'm afraid there won't be any mention of Abinit for the whole duration of the talk. But uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's been implemented in Abinit, uh, I, I assure you. And there will be the next two talks that will be give some detail about it. Uh, but since it's been something that we, it took us uh, five years to learn how to do it, uh, already at the, at the level of the method, so I thought it would be good for, uh, for me to, to give uh, first uh, a bit of an overview of the theory that lies behind uh, these calculations. Uh, so, um, okay, let's be, see if this works. Uh, these here are the people that are, have been involved, apart from myself, in this project. Uh, Andrea Schiaffino is a student who is not here. Uh, David Vanderbilt, you, you all uh, know him already. Uh, and then there is Mikel Royo and uh, Cyrus Dreyer who are here and will be giving the talk after me. Uh, okay, let me get started. So spatial dispersion means uh, essentially uh, that in real space we are looking at the response, at physical response to a gradient of the applied field or the real space moment uh, of the response to some uh, uniform field. And in reciprocal space, this, uh, as you all know, translates into a Q dependence, a wave vector dependence of the response function. So these effects have, have started to be popular since the, 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 um, the 60s, uh, in particular in the context of optical uh, response. And uh, here, if you write the uh, optical conductivity tensor of some material as a function of the wave vector and omega, uh, you can write a, a long wave expansion of this uh, uh, response uh, in uh, uh, small powers of Q. And uh, at, uh, at zero order in Q, we have the usual optical conductivity, uh, while at first order in Q, we have some interesting effects uh, like the magnetoelectric uh, response or the natural optical activity that uh, have been, as I said, very popular in the 60s and now are uh, enjoying a revival in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, another uh, context that is much less known, I guess, uh, is uh, uh, in the context of elasticity. You can also write the elastic tensor as a function of omega and k. Uh, and this is the exact uh, acoustic counterpart of the uh, natural optical activity, if you like. Uh, so the first order dispersion in Q, this it's K here, but it's Q, uh, uh, of the elastic tensor is what is called the, the uh, acoustic activity tensor. Uh, all these uh, tensors at first order in Q are, um, have an odd number, uh, an e uh, yeah, odd. Uh, odd number of indices, so they are only active in materials that break inversion symmetry. But anyway, uh, the main motivation for this talk uh, actually comes from a, a, a slightly different uh, topic, a slightly different area, which is that of electromechanical uh, response. And uh, as you will see in the following, we will learn how to deal with the dispersion of the electromechanical response, and at the same time, uh, solve the whole class of problems uh, that technically are related to uh, the uh, expansion in Q, and we will gain the ability also to uh, calculate the properties that I showed you in the first slide. So, uh, flexoelectricity, uh, well, piezoelectricity is uh, a property we all know, and the uh, first order dispersion counterpart of piezoelectricity is flexoelectricity, which, has, which is the response. Uh, the polarization response of uh, an insulating crystal to a strain gradient, uh, which is uh, the, uh, this symbol here. It's a fourth rank tensor, so it's a universal property of all materials. Unlike piezoelectricity, you don't need uh, a microscopic breakdown of inversion symmetry. Uh, and it also scales at the inverse of the sample size. You, you can bend a, a material uh, more if it's thinner. Uh, so it's, 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 it's gained a lot of interest lately, uh, especially with the advent of nanotechnology where you can really uh, grow small nanostructures and look at really what is the impact of strain gradients uh, in the physical properties. So we want to calculate this from first principles, but here we run into the main problem 
the main conceptual problem that lies behind this Burgeon effects, uh, which is that translational symmetry is broken. We are applying a non-uniform uh, strain or a non-uniform field in general. So in principle, we cannot use periodic boundary conditions, block theorem, plane waves, etc., etc. But uh, of course, there is a way around, and this is uh, uh, by using modulation uh, in Q of the perturbation and then doing an expansion in uh, Q. So in the case of flex electricity, we look at acoustic phonons. And if you uh, take a snapshot of an acoustic phonon, you will identify in some parts of this wave there are uh, indeed some strain gradients. What do we want to do with acoustic phonons? Uh, well, we want to use density functional perturbation theory uh, to calculate the polarization response, the macrosco macroscopic polarization response to an acoustic phonon, including uh, electronic effects and lattice mediated effects and uh, everything that might be physically relevant. And the second thing we want to do is to take a very small Q and uh, uh, take a Taylor expansion along, uh, around the gamma point in the Brillouin zone, which corresponds to uh, uh, taking the long wave uh, limit. And if we do that, we can write the polarization as a Taylor expansion in Q, where at uh, uh, zero order in Q, we, we just have the sum, the sublattice sum of the uh, Born effective charges, which clearly vanishes. And at first order in Q, we have the piezoelectric tensor. And finally, at second order in Q, we have the uh, flexoelectric tensor that we are looking for. So in the rest of my talk, I will mostly uh, focus on this part of the problem, which is uh, how to take a Taylor expansion in Q uh, around uh, the gamma point of some response function. So, uh, OK, uh, let me take a, a very quick and brief overview of density functional perturbation theory. Uh, we start with an external potential. As you all know, we develop uh, a power expansion in terms of some perturbation parameter lambda. Then we get uh, the energy and the wave functions can be uh, developed uh, in powers with respect to this parameter. And in the end, we can write uh, an expression for the derivatives of the total energy with respect to the parameter, in particular, uh, the first order are generalized forces, which I can write in terms of the ground state wave functions. Uh, at the second order in the energy, I need the first order wave functions with respect to lambda, and this is the second order energy, which is uh, the linear response property which we are interested in. And uh, these first order wave functions are given by the Sternheimer equation that you all know. Uh, but what I want to uh, emphasize uh, is that uh, this second order energy can be written uh, as a variational functional of the first order wave function. So I can write this uh, formula which look, looks much more complicated than this expression here. But actually this is nice because unlike the previous expression, I can, uh, I can be sure that this is uh, uh, a variational minimum, a constrained variational minimum of this functional with respect to uh, Psi 1. And uh, uh, I emphasize constraint because uh, uh, for this problem to be well defined, uh, I need to impose the so-called parallel transport gauge on the first order wave functions. So make sure that they are orthogonal to the valence manifold. Uh, and here I get the stationary condition, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing uh, is, uh, we did uh, is to uh, actually rewrite the, uh, the variational uh, formulation into an unconstrained uh, variational functional. Uh, and you see here that there's little change with respect to the previous expression, except that I inserted uh, some Q and P, which are nothing but band projectors on the conduction uh, and the valence band in some strategic places. Uh, why do I do that? Because doing this, the, the final, the minimum value of the functional is not, uh, uh, is exactly the same as the functional I showed before. But uh, if I choose this A parameter uh, larger than the valence bandwidth, I can make sure that this functional is actually, uh, has a well-defined minimum and automatically enforces orthogonality to the valence subspace. Uh, why do I need that? Well, uh, in order to study dispersion, I need to take 
a monochromatic perturbation at some value of q and uh, th then take a derivative in q but to take derivatives in q is a bit delicate because the states uh, at different k points are not uh, necessarily um, uh, do not have a, a necessarily a well-defined phase relationship there is a sort of phase and indeterminacy in the ground state wave function uh, so this uh, uh, taking an unconstrained functional is uh, uh, very uh, useful in this context because uh, now the only objects that depend explicitly on Q in the functional are operators or band projectors and these I can derive them uh, without worries about the phase indeterminacy because they are well defined these are gauge invariant objects uh, and then the nice thing is that I don't need to take the derivative of the first order wave functions because of the variational character or the stationary character of this uh, second order expression. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, some functional that uh, mathematically depends parametrically on some Q, on some parameter Q. So I can treat this Q now as if it were a generic uh, perturbation parameter and just perform a perturbative expansion by using all the machinery of perturbation theory that uh, we are used to. Uh, for example, the 2n plus 1 theorem for uh, uh, constructing a, uh, an economical expression for the quantities I'm interested in. Uh, the main relationship I, I, I need is uh, what I told you, uh, what I just told you that the total derivative with respect to Q of the second order energy is uh, equal to uh, the uh, partial derivative of the variational functional just because of this uh, first order 2n plus 1 theorem which is nothing but uh, 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 a flavor of the Hellman-Feynman theorem. Okay, by doing this I get uh, some nasty formulas but in reality uh, these are all made of uh, uh, objects that I already have in Abinit uh, or are relatively simple to uh, implement uh, and I do not need to implement a new response function this is, uh, uh, this is the real deal here so this here is the Q gradient of the Coulomb kernel uh, it's pretty simple, it's an analytical formula this here is the velocity operator which I need to take the scalar, uh, the, the, the is mean value between the first order wave functions. This is the K gradient of the band projector, which is simply constructed starting from uh, the D in DK response function. And these are the really new things, the only things I need to implement, which are the uh, Q gradient of the perturbing operator, which is anyway something analytic that I know from the start. So essentially, without uh, doing anything, by simply reusing the response functions that are already present in Abinit, I can uh, get, uh, uh, I can extract the values for the uh, uh, derivatives in Q of any uh, response uh, property. So is this useful? Let's go back to flexoelectricity. So this is the formula we had at the beginning uh, mu, uh, the mu tensor as the second derivative in Q of the polarization response to an acoustic phonon. Uh, is what I showed you uh, useful to solve this problem? Well, the first thing we need to write it as a second derivative of the energy uh, and so we can write it as a second derivative of, of the energy with respect to an electric field perturbation at some Q uh, and an acoustic phonon at some Q. The only problems here is that uh, I have uh, um, uh, the, the implementation of Abinit as, a as an electric field only at Q equals zero. Uh, acoustic phonon, what is this? Um, and then it's a second order derivative in Q. So what uh, is this useful for? Well, actually we could solve all three problems and get an expression which is uh, exactly as simple or as complicated as the one I showed you before. Uh, because uh, uh, from, uh, for, for the acoustic phonon, actually, we uh, rewrite it as a uh, metric wave perturbation in spirit with the work uh, of uh, Don Hammond of the uniform strain response. Uh, 
uh, I'm citing his work to make the chairman <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so essentially, we uh, we take a, uh, we define an acoustic phonon as a simultaneous displacement of all atoms, so a sublattice sum of uh, the phonon perturbations. But instead of treating it in the uh, laboratory frame, we do a simultaneous coordinate transformation to a curvilinear frame where the atom do not move from their position. So a, a curvilinear frame that follows the atomic position. And by doing this, you get a sort of metric wave that uh, uh, at q equals zero vanishes just because in the curvilinear frame, translation, these translations are uh, irrelevant. And at first order in q, we exactly recover uh, Don Hammond's theory of uniform, stra uniform strain. Um, regarding the electric field, we use this relationship of classical uh, electrodynamics, uh, so in, in practice the problem is only to, um, uh, to calculate the response to a vector potential field, to a modulated vector potential field, and we need the, the low Q expansion which involves the D in decay, D2 in decay, and also the orbital B field uh, response. Uh, in the end we get uh, uh, the second order formula, which is what I showed you before. Uh, essentially, the, 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 the fact that the, the metric response vanishes at q equals zero uh, makes this uh, possible. Uh, so we, we get, again, all known objects that are already available in Abinit, plus something that is, again, uh, already available in Abinit, the D2 in DK. I don't know about the orbital magnetic field. Um, hmm. But, uh, well, uh, at some point it will uh, have to, to be implemented, I guess. Uh, so this is the summary, essentially what I said before. Uh, results and the details of the implementation, as I said, will uh, be uh, presented by Mikel. Uh, there are lots of uh, things uh, to be done yet. Uh, Decisions to, to be taken about how to fit this into AnaDDB and all that stuff. Uh, and I would like to uh, hear your opinion about that. But anyway, I'm way over time, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>